Uh, I'd like to present uh, Professor Melanie Mitchell. She's a professor of computer science at Portland State University and an external professor at the Santa Fe uh, Institute. Uh, her major works has been in the areas of analogical reasoning, complex systems, genetic algorithms, and cellular automata, where she is among the most highly cited uh, researchers. Um, she originally received her PhD in uh, 1990 from the University of Michigan under AI luminaries uh, Douglas, Douglas Hofstetter uh, of uh, Godel Escher Bach fame, uh, if anyone recognizes that, and uh, John Holland, who's a pioneer in uh, genetic algorithms. And uh, uh, one of the kind of the uh, primary works that came out of her PhD was this uh, the copycat cognitive uh, architecture. And uh, right, so I guess I'll I'll let you uh, I'll let you take it from here, Professor Mitchell. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to come to this uh, this conference. Can you see my slides okay? Okay, hopefully you can. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about abstraction and analogy in both natural and artificial intelligence. Many of you will probably know that uh, one of the first things that in the world of AI was the dark project, which was proposed by McCarthy, Minsky and others in 1955. And in their proposal, they suggested that what they could do over the summer <laughs> would be to help figure out how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, and solve for humans and improve themselves. And now, nowadays, all these things are still open problems many decades later, but especially this one, forming abstractions and concepts. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means and how AI systems are attempting to go about doing that. So deep neural networks, of course, spurred a revolution in AI based on ideas from how the visual system in the brain works as a, as a hierarchical set of layers in which information is processed uh, from lower levels to higher levels, resulting in, at least in this deep neural network, uh, probability distributions over possible uh, concepts. Okay. This was shown in particularly impressive fashion on the ImageNet object recognition competition in which uh, neural networks and other machines competed to classify objects. And you can see here a plot of the error rate going down over the years of the competition until it's now lower than the estimated human performance on this data set. And all of the low the the advances that really dramatically decreased this error rate were due to deep neural networks so deep neural networks have been a revolutionary technology the media has told us that computers are now better than humans at recognizing images not exactly true captioning reading documents and answering questions about it self-driving cars will be a permanent backseat driver from 2020 well that hasn't exactly happened yet so the real question though that that is unanswered these days is what exactly is it that these machines are learning so here's an example of a project that was done in my lab where a student tried to train a deep neural network to distinguish photos of animals and photos without animals landscape photos I work on a data set from National Geographic magazine that had lots of these uh, different nature images. And it did very well, but then when he tried to figure out what exactly it had looked, he found some surprising results. So for example, notice on the animal image that the background is blurry because the photographer is focusing on the animal in the foreground. Whereas here on this no animal image, the background is clear because there's nothing in the foreground to focus on. And that cue, which is actually unrelated to what we humans notice in this image, was part of the reason why the neural network did so well. It was using that cue rather than the actual task of learning to recognize an animal. The notion that machines sometimes learn things that about the data set that aren't something that we're really trying to teach them is called a shortcut learning or learning statistical anom anomalies and so on. And it seems to be 
something that happens quite a lot of the time. So another group did a study where they took a robot that had a camera on it to take pictures of objects in a house. And they said, what, suppose a neural network is trained on images of those same objects, but ones that are downloaded from the web, like the ImageNet challenge. How well would something that had learned from images on the web transfer to images that were taken by a household robot? And it turns out that if you train on images learned from the web and test on images learned from the web, all these different deep neural network architectures do very well, okay? This is the accuracy, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, et cetera. Whereas if you train on images from the web and test on images taken from the robot of those same objects, the accuracy goes way down. So somehow the learning from images of objects on the web is not, learn, the, the machines are not learning to recognize those objects in general. So they're learning something, perhaps something that's not something humans would necessarily focus in on. This is also seen by examples of training deep neural networks to, to recognize objects like fire trucks. Here's one where a deep neural network was 99% confident that this is a fire truck. But then this group tried photoshopping these objects in different poses in the image and found that the neural network here was now 98% certain this is a school bus, a fireboat, or a bobsled. So what is the neural network learning that makes it very confident that this is a fire truck and this is a school bus, something very different from what humans have learned when they learn to recognize these objects. In the realm of game playing, this failure to generalize can be seen by machines that have learned to play Breakout, uh, a video game in the Atari suite, so a, a deep neural network that learned to, to do um, deep cue learning or reinforcement learning uh, was used and learned to play breakout just by watching videos of the game and taking actions, learned to be better than humans. But then if you then shift the paddle up by a few pixels, any human would be able to adapt to that immediately, but the machine that had learned on this version of the game was not able to do well at all on this version of the game. And most of you are probably familiar with the phenomenon of adversarial attacks on deep learning vision systems. So for example, here, this famous attack where you can put adversarial stickers on a stop sign and trick the deep neural network into thinking this is a speed limit 80 sign. So the quest, real question is, what is it that these networks are learning in uh, these images? And in psychology, there's a notion of perceptual categories, which seems to be what these networks are learning, but that's quite different from what we humans learn. We humans learn what I'm calling concepts. So let's look at the difference there. So, Think about the um, pictures of bridges or the concept of a bridge. Um, you can imagine that a deep neural network might be able to learn to visually recognize images of bridges if it was given a big enough data set of them. But we humans have learned something much more rich, much more flexible. For instance, we can recognize this strange situation as a a different kind of bridge. This is actually a bridge of water, made up of water, for boats to cross over a highway, and it's called a water bridge. Or we can recognize the notion of a bridge in the context of ants here that are building a bridge with their bodies so that other ants from the colony can move from one surface to another. We recognize bridging your hands, or the bridge of a nose, or the bridge of a song, and you can see I'm getting more and more abstract here. So this is the notion of abstraction in concepts, and it's fundamental to our human ability to deal with concepts in a very flexible way. We can talk about bridging, bridging ceremonies from one level to another, or 
Joe Biden talking about how he's a bridge to a new generation of leaders. These are all very abstract notions, but they're all fundamentally grounded in our basic concept of what a bridge is. And you can do this with any concept you like, you know, and you can just go on and on with these abstractions. And this is very fundamental to human intelligence. And it's what the original founders of AI back in 1955 were talking about when they said, learn abstractions and concepts. And it's something that even current day AI is not able to do in any general way. Hofstadter referred to concepts as packages of analogies, which you can kind of see as the um, notion of bridge is being extended further and further. And I think that's really relevant that in order to get human-like concepts, we have to be able to get machines to make analogies. That is to recognize deep similarity in situations that are superficially very different. So how is it that we can get machines to learn concepts rather than perceptual categories and to make analogies? Well, this is something that field have been working on for decades. I'm gonna talk about two approaches since I don't have very much time, but I'd be happy to get into other approaches later on. So first, an approach to, um, that's based on deep neural networks using this idealized domain called Raven's progressive matrices. The idea here is that um, this is a, it's a, a, an actual IQ test that's used for humans, a pattern recognition and abstraction task where I say, okay, look along the columns, the rows and columns of this matrix with these different figures. Given the kinds of changes that are being made, what figure should go in this blank space given these candidate answers? Okay, and you can see there's different kinds of shapes and colorings and sizes and orientations and all kinds of different attributes. But if you look at it closely, you should be able to see that number five is the right answer here. Another example is this one, uh, where the idea is to get to the thing in the third column, you combine the two things in the first and second column. Okay. So the answer here would be eight. There's um, many of these Ravens problems that were devised to study human intelligence. And in fact, it's been claimed by psychologists that doing well on these problems is correlated highly with, hum with uh, human intelligence or high human intelligence. That's debatable. But what I'm interested in is using machines to do these kinds of abstraction tasks. And in the last year or so, there's been a lot of interest in applying deep learning to these tasks. You know, we know that deep learning systems can do fairly well on object recognition and various language tasks and so on, but can they do abstract reasoning? Well, this group uh, in 2020, earlier this year, published uh, a, a study of using deep neural networks to do these abstraction tasks where the input is these 16 figures, the, the eight figures in the matrix and the eight possible answers. And then you stick in some kind of deep neural network here. I'm showing a ResNet, which is a kind of uh, deep neural network. And the answer, the network is trained to give a probability distribution over the eight possible answers. And then pick the one with the highest probability. Now, to train a deep neural network, you need lots and lots of examples. For example, this group used about 42,000 training examples. Well, where do you get all those examples? They haven't created 42,000 examples. So they have to create them automatically. Okay, so this is typical of the kinds of abstraction uh, research that's done with deep neural networks. We take a problem and we figure out a way to uh, create these problems, training problems automatically by setting up a kind of grammar, we call it a stochastic image grammar, where we can sample, the machine can sample these different structures, um, like inside, outside, there's something on the outside, there's something on the inside, the outside component has a certain shape, the inside component has a certain shape. You can go down this tree sampling probabilistically what should go in the problem and then generating these problems automatically. 
Okay, so then you have tens of thousands of problems to train on, and then the machines are able to do very well tasks. Uh, you can ignore these other uh, columns, but this column just shows in general how different machines did accuracy-wise on these problems that were generated. Humans got about 84% right, but the best neural networks got about 90% right. So what's going on? We have to say, what did these machines learn? Well, it turned out um, in a different paper, it was discovered that these machines had learned some biases that were shortcuts that were not intended by the people who were training them, just like I showed before. And here's, the, here's one of the things that it learned. It turns out that the way that they made the answer set is by taking the correct answer and modifying one attribute eight, uh, seven times to create seven incorrect answers and one correct answer. But that creates an unintended shortcut for a machine so that if you look, just look at the answers, don't even look at the problem and take the majority across the answers for each attribute, like Pentagon is the most frequent shape, dark is the most frequent color, large is the most frequent size, and so on. That shows you what the correct answer is. And in fact, if you train on the candidate answers only, ignoring the context matrix, that, that's that context blind ResNet, the system does as well as it did originally. So here the problem is that this automatic creation of problems sets the system up to being susceptible to shortcuts. A balance, what they call a balanced or unbiased version was made, but I'm not totally convinced that doesn't have shortcuts either. But more generally, there's been a huge amount of work in this area of trying to train various neural networks on these Ravens-like problems, and it's ongoing. But I do think there are some limitations to this deep learning approach. Uh, the first limitation is that it requires a very large corpus of examples you need to generate automatically. Um, and we don't know exactly what the machines have learned. And finally, if the goal is general human-like abstraction abilities, does it even make sense to have to train on tens of thousands of examples? Abstraction and analogy in essence should be about few shot learning. That means training on only a few examples. So let me show you an exa example of some of my own work on this. This is the copycat arch architecture from 1995. So this is sort of a, in contrast with deep neural networks. Um, work done with Hofstetter. Here, we didn't use Raven's problems, but we used a kind of another kind of idealized analogy, these letter string analogies. If ABC changes to ABD, what does PQRS change to? Okay, most people would say PQRT. Of course, there's multiple possible answers, kinds of different analogy problems that explore some of the same kinds of abstraction issues that we're, we face in the real world. So we meant to, to study these problems as idealized situations with objects, relationships, groups, actions, events. And it was meant to be a general tool for exploring issues in abstraction and analogy. Okay, so the architecture was based much more on sort of cognitive uh, inspiration like short-term memory where the problem which we called the workspace that interacted with a network of concepts through a set of perceptual agents these agents are small pieces of code that um, try and make sense of the analogy in a perceptual way that is in a dynamic way where you can think of the eyes moving around to different parts of this problem and try it with feedback through a, con a network of concepts. So let me show you an example, um, a, a little quick little demo. I have about uh, to go here. So this is a demo of a uh, version of Copycat on this problem, ABC changes to CBA. What do we do to this longer string? 
And what you'll see is this set of agents trying out different possibilities for um, relationships. And the ones that have some evidence get to stick. And the darker the um, line is, the more evidence the system's found for that. So for instance, here, it finds a group of keys. And now that causes it to more quickly search for other groups. So there's a kind of feedback effect here. And as the system becomes more and more um, certain of the direction it's going, which is reflected in this temperature, as temperature gets lower, it becomes more and more focused and um, deterministic, and finally is able to make a kind of coherent representation of the whole analogy and give an answer which reverses the direction of all the groups. Okay, so I'm gonna, there's many important ideas from this architecture, which I don't have time to go over, but it does have some limitations. Its architecture is fairly ad hoc, and we have to show that it can generalize, that it can do something beyond these idealized kinds of problems. And also, we have to figure out how to form new concepts beyond what's already given to it in its prior repertoire, such as, you know, it knows about grouping, it knows about letters, successorship, and the order in the alphabet, and so on. So to make it more general, we have to solve a number of problems. There's been other, many other approaches in this field, including techniques like probabilistic program induction, what's been called meta-learning, and neuro-symbolic architectures. It's a very um, active area, and I'm really excited about prospects for this. But I think in order for AI to go beyond the kinds of perceptual categories that it's been able to learn and move on to human-like concepts that will allow it to be less brittle and less and more able to generalize, we do have to solve this problem of abstraction. So how to make progress? There's a lot of questions. Should we look at idealized versus real world domains? Should we look at tasks like the Raven's problems, which have multiple choice, versus tasks in which the system has to generate its own answer, like in copycat? Do we allow extensive training versus um, few shot learning? Knowledge should we give? I won't go into that. And how do we evaluate the results? Can we go beyond accuracy to looking at more robustness and being able to scale to um, more complex problems and being able to transfer what one has learned from one domain to another. Um, so I wrote about this in a, some of this in a recent paper on crashing the barrier of meaning in AI, which you can download from my website, melaniemitchell.me. And also in a recent book uh, that, that I published called Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. And thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, one second. All right. So I'll have to do in with these questions. Uh, but uh, okay, so the first question is, um, can we use uh, kind of back propagation, the concept, uh, concept of back, back propagation uh, to help um, explain kind of learning how, uh, how intelligent systems kind of update their, uh, like update themselves. So does that, does the kind of uh, metaphor of, or a concept of back propagation, is there any kind of biological basis for that or uh, yeah, in, in terms of learning? Right. So by, back propagation is the, the biological basis for it has been long debated. Uh, I think the it really depends on the exact details you talk about. There's not that much known about that kind of thing in the brain, but but clearly there's some kind of credit assignment going on in the brain. Uh, we can, to some extent, use a kind of back propagation to investigate what a system has learned, but that's still limited in, in, in the realm of deep neural networks. I see. Okay. Um, all right. Second question is, um, so uh, can you, uh, can videos provide uh, kind of any kind of common sense knowledge in terms of kind of physics uh, and uh, that the, the kind of common sense knowledge that uh, images would lack? So can, can a model learn 
more kind of a physical model from video, whereas it couldn't from, from images? That's a great question. Yeah, I think absolutely. There's a lot more information in videos. It's a lot easier to, to learn from them. Of course, um, uh, you can also have this kind of shortcut learning in videos, depending on the, the kind of data you're looking at. Uh, but people are working on that and people are working on using videos to teach uh, machines about sort of intuitive physics and object interactions. There, there's a lot of work in that area. So yeah, I think videos uh, are a way forward as well as a kind of immersive uh, virtual reality environments. I see. Okay. So, uh, in Okay, next question. So in terms of uh, Raven's, uh, Raven's generation, so yeah, using grammar, um, uh, is, 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 is generalization what is what's happening or is it simply just kind of remembering, memorizing kind of these patterns? So if, if the generator kind of distribution changes, would it be able to kind of adapt in, in these situations? Right, so it, it turns out that these systems, um, it's hard to know to what extent they're just sort of memorizing versus generalizing because it's hard to know exactly what they learned and the data sets themselves have certain biases that don't do a good job of testing the machines. So this is still, this is why people are still trying to, you know, move forward on figuring out what are the right data sets and, and, and what, what are ways to make sense of what the machine has learned. So yeah, it's still an open question, I would say. Well, okay. Um, so can we glean anything kind of intuitive uh, in any kind of significant manner uh, from, uh, from kind of about the human brain from the kind of shortcuts that ML models take? Um, so, I mean, do you, do you see that in your research or uh, in terms of kind of shortcut taking? Um, okay, I think, can we glean anything about the human brain? Um, so, in some cases, I think these that machines take show us that they're not doing what the brain does. They're not perceiving the same kind of things that we perceive in their data. Now, humans also have shortcut learning. You know, humans and animals, we see yes. that. Um, and there's ways that we try and test humans for generalization. You know, when we give students an exam, we try and make sure that our exam doesn't just test superficial features that people have learned but sort of more generalization so i don't know what more to say about that but this is a big issue in machine learning is how to test machines to see if they actually did generalize or not right i mean what about like clever hans uh there's this problem with uh kind of these transformer models and this notion of kind of this clever hans kind of artifact where it's, it's mostly memorizing kind of these statistical correlations rather than uh, actually learning um, the grammar, like the underlying kind of structure in the data. So, uh, so I guess how would you, how can you kind of test, uh, let's say, state of the art models right now in trend, let's say, like NLP models with these kind of uh, shortcut tests or these uh, clever Hans tests? Yeah, so I think this has, so we have to go beyond just testing accuracy on a fixed data set, that that's kind of been the paradigm in machine learning, and that cannot, that can obscure sort of shortcuts that have been taken. So people in, in like natural language processing have developed what they sometimes call adversarial state testing sets, which are yeah. designed to kind of uh, probe these machines better than just a fixed testing set. So this is a this is an area of active research, I would say, and it's really important. Right. Uh, certainly, certainly. Okay, next question. Uh, wouldn't the ABC problem require more kind of general broad training in common sense and knowledge and reasoning similar to what we do with babies? So kind of teaching babies uh, alphabet through ABCs. And uh, so, um, so this kind of small data set is actually quite large because there's a, maybe a larger amount of like maybe uh, general knowledge that, that that's being absorbed that uh, is not explicit. Right. right. So so in the the letter string analogies, you know, we give the program a certain set of concepts, 
rather small set of consonants. So it can't, it can't do a lot of the things that humans would be able to do even with the alphabet. Uh, but you're right, in any given sort of data set, you have a lot of human experience. Humans bring a lot more experience to it than the machines. And so you have to take that into account. Um, and it's really, uh, it's kind of an art to design domains that we can use to, to test machines that don't contain human, don't require human, extensive human experience. Right. Um, I guess, can you comment on, I guess, some GPT-3 kind of analogy experiments and what you see at kind of the, let's say, the cutting edge of uh, NLP at the moment and how, uh, how, that, uh, how it works with uh, analogy, analogy building? I guess. Yeah, so I did some testing with GPT-3 and the letter string analogies. I published a little post about that. Um, and I found that it was very mixed. It was able to do certain kinds of abstraction, but not others. And one of the problems with GPT-3 is that it, the way the program behaves, it really depends on how, what the prompts to it look like. And so if you say it can't do something, then another a, a sort of proponent could come back and say, well, you just didn't give it the right prompts. But I think in terms of right. sort of comparing to human abstraction, humans are much more flexible. You know, they don't need exactly the right prompts. So I don't really know what to say about that. GPT-3 is very mysterious, exactly how it works and how it, you know, whether the extent to which it's actually kind of making abstractions versus uh, general, you know, not generalizing, but memorizing its training data. And I think, you know, there needs to be kind of a science of big language models and what they're doing. because I think people don't really understand it right now. I guess how how would you optimize uh, kind of a model like that, or how would you you can't? It's hard to prove uh, a negative. Let's say it's hard to prove that uh, there are no prompts that exist that could uh, allow it to kind of predict this, right? So, uh, or like, what are the tools that can help analyze? Uh, uh, I guess kind of these these more these harder kind of abstract kind of concepts of like existence of prompts, or how would you optimize prompts? Like, what is the optimal prompt that would give like uh, let's say, uh, general like that would allow the model to generalize well in this, like how, how would you? Yeah, I don't know. I really, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows very well. And what I got, what I sensed at least from like interacting with GPT-3 is that, you know, we adapt to it as much as it adapts to us, that we kind of right. learn how to use it most effectively over time, rather than having it learn about, you know, the patterns that we're giving it so it's like we're meeting it halfway almost right and and you think that uh, that's there's kind of this paradigm shift where there's this human ai interaction component now where uh you have to kind of maybe optimally you have to optimize your own in, i guess how you input model uh, information to the model or um yeah how, how you prompt the model so is do you, do you like let's say open ai recently came out with uh uh, feedback, human in the loop kind of feedback as, as a way of uh, improving summarization results. And then they showed that that worked at scale, that worked much better than kind of the supervised, traditional kind of supervised techniques. So this kind of human AI interaction, do you see that uh, playing a uh, kind of larger role in, in research? Yeah. yeah, that has to be the, you know, that's going to be, if we want to deploy AI systems that don't have the kinds of common sense or abstraction abilities that we humans have, we're going to have to uh, partner with, uh, as I said, kind of meet them halfway. And we see this with uh, uh, vehicles as well, that we're, we have to kind of engineer the infrastructure for them to be able to safely uh, navigate it. They can't navigate everything right. in our world. So we have to restrict the world and let them, you know, to go to where they are. Right, right. Um... I, I guess one one question is, can you make humans kind of think like we're always kind of thinking of artificial intelligence thinking like humans? Do you think that humans kind of think like artish or can think algorithmically or artificially like an artificial uh, intelligence in, in a certain like is there is it a bi-directional kind of thing? Is is kind of human, natural intelligence fluid or is it um, uh, like yeah? So well, we all adapt to our our tools, right? I mean we. We learn how to use like web search. We learn how to build prompts that are you know, queries that are going to be most successful. Um, and uh, 
we we humans are are quite flexible, so I think we're we're pretty good at adapting to, you know, AI systems, and I think you know I, the it, it is definitely going to be a team, <laughs> kind of a team effort where they adapt to what we want and we adapt to how they work. Right, it's kind of like a co-evolution uh, kind of scenario. Okay, uh, I, I guess um, uh, I'll keep asking questions until you want. Uh, until you, I guess you want to. Do we have, have to, do we up, have to so. stop at a certain point? I think it was two fifty. Uh, it was two fifty, but uh, yeah, uh, as long as you want to stay, uh, people yes. are kind of adding more questions. Uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, so I guess as long as maybe ten more minutes. Uh, okay. Um, so I guess what kind of loss function uh, do people use for compositional reasoning? So can you formulate this as a loss function that you can optimize or like what's what's the uh, structure here? Um, that one I don't know the answer to. Um, how you optimize a cost function for compositional reasoning. And it may be that like the whole paradigm of optimizing a cost function is not the right approach to solving these reasoning problems. So that's a that's an open question, I think. Open question. Okay. And I, I guess um, uh, how, how do you see this kind of uh, how how would you make your mode of kind of learning uh, scalable? Let's say like analogical reasoning. How, how, how does it scale to let's say let's say like GPT three, right? They they just fed it the entire all, all the data on the internet that they could find, they kind of cleaned it in some way, and that gave it some kind of uh, general kind of knowledge, and then you can kind of fine tune. So is can you generate analogies, or how, how do you, um, is, is it kind of from the data generation size that, that this kind of problem uh, that should be tackled, or is it from the model itself? Like, where, where do you think the biggest kind of, like, in terms of scaling, in terms of the scaling? Yeah. I think it's the model itself. I think that we don't yet know um, how to get these systems to uh, perceive concepts in a general way. You know, we don't know know how to get them to take the knowledge that they have and apply it in in a trustworthy and robust way in new situations. So I, I think it's a more model of more matter of of, of kind of solving problems at the level of the model rather than data. I think that big data and, and you know, I'm not, not everyone in AI would agree with me, but big data is not going to solve this problem. That's my take. Right. I see. I mean, but uh, what would you say, um, like, let's say transformers are very good at memorizing lots of information. They seem to kind of interpolate between samples that they've seen in their training data very well. Uh, as as kind of proven by GPT three, so is it possible to just generate lots of analogies and then have uh, run it through a transformer model and and have it try to kind of uh, you just like then it kind of interpolates between analogies? I guess that's that's kind of a uh, like how you, how you would implement that in, in a sense. So you you would you, you're saying that there's some limitations to that. I think it would be that would be an interesting experiment, but the problem is where do you like get all the training data? And we saw mm -hmm. that it should try and generate it uh, in, some, in some algorithmic way. It, you might not, you might end up with shortcut, you know, biases and things that it can learn that, that you don't really want it to learn. So I think that would be a very interesting project, but transformers need so much data that it's, I think, hard right. to do that experiment. I see. I see. Um, okay, so uh, okay, is there a potential fallacy to measure? Is it a potential fallacy to measure uh, machines having learned uh, in terms of concepts again against human understanding of concepts? Is that kind of a, a personification? Uh, is is like is uh, or how how would, uh, I guess concepts as a unit? Is that a computable unit that you want to kind of build these kind of algorithms on or? Good, good question. Um, so the word concept is not does not have a. It's a central notion in psychology, but like you can think of a lot of cognitive psychology as trying to define what a concept is, and there's all kinds of different theories about concepts that came out of uh, uh, co cognitive science, but there's not a uniform agreement on what that means. 
But it's one of those notions that I think we have to lose in order to understand what we mean by intelligence in general, another non, non rigorously defined uh, term. Um, yeah. Whether, you know, whether we could, how we could test what machine as a concept, you know, I think is, is a difficult question, but trying to get it to, to make these kinds of analogies, you know, if I were going to give a Turing test to definitely include analogies in there. Right, right, definitely. Um, uh, what about, uh, okay, what about in terms of biases, kind of uh, uh, learned biases and, and how, how do biases kind of, uh, how do you encode those in terms of kind of analogies or concepts? Is it if we're, if we're teaching machines to, to kind of uh, think uh, anal anal analogically, uh, are we biasing it kind of with our own, uh, I guess it, it is uh, absorbing human in some sense, okay. right? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to answer that question. So, so if you teach it to think analogically, we're, you know, making analogies is a is a big part of the way humans think, <laughs> even yeah. unconsciously, we're doing it all the time. Uh, so, if if you're worried, if if the question is, you know, are we, um, if we make getting machines to make analogies, is that kind of biasing them to think the way we think? Yes, right. but don't know any other way to think <laughs> right so right. so that's you know maybe machines maybe ai will come up with different ways to think I, you know it's hard to even talk about but um i i don't really know what that means in terms yes. of you know if the question is is it absorbing human biases like you know there was a you know there, there was this example of analogies made by these using these word embeddings, you know, this the yes. person like two vec, and you could do uh, uh, vector arithmetic on these word embeddings and get analogies like man is to woman is to queen. But then that if you it's there, there's been a, there were a lot of biases, sort of like gender and racial right. and other kinds of biases that came out there because human language obviously has a lot of biases in it. So yeah, machines will yeah. absorb these biases on any human data. For, for sure. I guess in terms of, um, uh, do, do you think you can reduce uh, analogy or analogical reasoning to kind of vector addition? So in, in kind of like a word to vec model, uh, you have, uh, you can kind of reduce it to kind of adding and subtracting vectors. Uh, is it is it something that you can compute with like in a vector form? Is that is that how you see it, or is it more uh, structured some other way? Like yeah, I, I personally think it's structured a different way in humans. At least <laughs> whether you can do it in some vector space remains to be seen. You know, word to vec. There were some uh, papers that that showed certain kinds of analogies it could make, but it actually when you really dug into it, it wasn't very good at making analogies. That 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 approach wasn't very good at it. And typically, you know, you want to make analogies beyond just words, you know, like like man is to woman, king is to queen, or whatever. You want you have structured situations. Um, you know, people are now making a, sort of what's going on in politics now with what went on in politics, you know, 40 years ago or something, and there's this whole structured situation that people, you know, are, are trying, are making sense of via this analogy. So it goes beyond, much beyond these word, word-based analogies. Right, right. Okay. I guess you can, uh, maybe in, you have to embed it like a concept, like if you have a embedding of a concept, it's kind of like a, I guess, I guess it's not so simple as, as just vector addition, that kind of thing. There's, there's, there's definitely kind of, Right. I mean, some some people, some deep learning proponents have said, you know, everything is vectors and we, we can just embed the entire world as vectors. Yes. That's debatable. Right. And I can't prove that you can't. But, you know, let's see where that approach goes. I, I'm not I'm dubious. OK, that's that's great. Very opinionated. Um, I, I guess one last thing might be how, how does um, do you see uh analogical reason as a way of kind of dealing with uncertainty or uh like 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 i, I was trying to think of um like how, how do you pair 
uh, kind of quantifying uncertainty and kind of optimizing around uncertainty with kind of like this analogical reasoning. So maybe one example is uh, uh, maybe you think that you're uncertain about kind of a certain outcome. Like let's say if I, uh, uh, what's, what's good, like swimming or something like that. So swimming, I, I haven't swam before, but I've done, I've kind of moved my arms and so I've kind of simulated maybe, or I can think of certain analogies that, w- that would make, make me I feel more comfortable, but it's kind of like uh, we're not necessarily when we're dealing with uncertainty, we're not necessarily computing kind of values. But how, how do you see kind of analogical reasoning as a way of kind of uh, an abstract kind of way of, of uh, dealing with this kind of uncertainty? Or Yeah, I think that's a very good way to think about it is that, you know, we when we encounter a new situation um, and we try to make analogies from previous situations we've been in, the, we we have a sense of how good the analogy is, and the, right, the better right. the analogy, the more certain we are about our ability to deal with it. Whereas if it's not a very good analogy, then um, you know maybe you're less certain. There's a lot more uncertainty there. Right. I, I guess how would you um, how do you quantify or measure goodness of analogy? I guess analogy is kind of like how do you, how, how does that something that's quantified? Is that is it possible to to quantify that or um that's something that people have been trying to do for a long time you know and there's different approaches um i you know i don't think there's a universal approach to that and i don't know how we we do it as humans but that's a really interesting question i guess there's no kind of axiomatic kind of way of building uh like these are the analogies that you can help you generalize like this kind of going back into kind of old school kind of ways of thinking um, where you, like, you're kind of trying to find some basis that, that you can help, that can help prove, let's say, all these theorems, let's say, in a, in a kind of an abstract sense. So do right. you, you think that's um, kind of like maybe kind of going back to Hofstetter and, and Gödel is kind of like these kind of systems are innately paradoxical or there's, uh, there's kind of self-reference paradoxes that, that kind of appear that never allow uh, using kind of having some basis of or axioms of analogies. Uh, let's say, or, or just using an axiomatic system um, that kind of limit its, its uh, ability to express, I guess, certain truths or something within the system. Yeah, so how do you... sure. I see where you're going, but I'm not sure that's what the, the direction I would go in. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that would be a long discussion, which yes. we don't have time for, unfortunately. Okay. Yes, okay, certainly, certainly. Okay. Um, I mean, I could, I could, people are very interested. They're still uh, asking questions. Uh, I don't, I don't want to hold you for too, too much longer. Uh, yes. Yeah. Why don't we do like one more question? Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so let me, uh, let me try to find a good setting. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, what do you see in studying kind of animals or insects uh, and kind of, or like kind of these other biological models and, and looking at maybe, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, is, is how, how high on the kind of abstraction level is, is, uh, is analogy building and can we observe it in like things like insects and kind of these other, other kind of models? That's a great question. Uh, wow, that's a deep question. Uh, I think that, you know, there's kind of a spectrum of abstraction ability that mm-hmm. uh, we're trying, you know, people, scientists are trying to map out what animals, what animal cognition is. And a lot of times we've underestimated animals, you know, we said, oh, birds don't have a, a frontal cortex, but actually they have some, it turns out they do have something that's kind of like that. And they, they can do a lot of abstraction. So I don't think we fully understand what animals can do. And I think actually studying animal cognition and animal sort of neuroscience is going to help us think about AI design. So I do think it's a promising area. Definitely. Definitely. Well, it sounds very exciting. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to kind of talk about your research. Uh, I definitely learned a lot. Um, People are, I'll I'll, I'll guess uh, you can kind of engage the chat if you want, but uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care.